Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2. The moment I'm in New York City, I'm a bit jet lagged, but with you nonetheless, I'm even a bit jet lagged when I'm in England, so that doesn't matter much. Um, a couple of announcements, please. This Saturday at 7 p.m. at the Church of the Open Door, 3rd Avenue and East 7th Street, Manhattan, in East Greenwich Village, uh, we have a meeting then, um, and uh, a meeting the following day, Sunday, 3.30 in the afternoon, at the Church of the Open Door in Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland. And the following Sunday, we shall be with Pastor Marco. James and myself will be with Pastor Marco in uh, Devore, near Los Angeles. But uh, Saturday, we will be at the Church of the Open Door, Manhattan. Sunday, Church of the Open Door, Morio Affiliated Fellowships in Baltimore. Right now, we're in New York City, and we're up to John chapter 2. Well, we've looked at the introduction to John in chapter 1. But the way John is structured, I would just like to very briefly pop over, by way of background to today's subject, to John chapter 5 very briefly. And in John chapter 5, Jesus gives multiple witnesses or multiple reasons to believe in him. Multiple reasons that people should, that is the Jewish people of this day and Jewish people this day, should believe in him. He begins with the witness of John the Baptist. He begins with the witness of the works, the miracles that he does, especially messianic miracles that only the Messiah was believed and is believed to be able to perform. The witness of the Father, the witness of the Scripture, and of course incorporated with the witness of the Scripture is the witness of Moses, incorporated with the witness of John, or the witnesses of the disciples of John, who became um, apostles. And then there is the witness, of course, of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter one, we see the witness of John the Baptist, the witness of John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah. We see the witness of John. Secondly, we see the witness of the Holy Spirit, the witness of the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus. We know from the synoptics that the witness of the Father also took place in John chapter 1, or at the baptism of Jesus, let's say, but it's not noted by John. John does not know the Father talking to Jesus. He saves it, and he speaks about the Father speaking directly to Jesus later on in the epistle, in John chapter 12. So even though we know from the synoptics the witness of the Father was there at the baptism, later on in John chapter 12, uh, where Jesus prays, Father, glorify thy name, and a voice comes out of heaven, I both glorified it, and will glorify it again. Well, of course, Lord willing, look at this when we get to John 12, but it's omitted from John's version of the baptism of Jesus, even though it happened. So we have the witnesses, the witness of John, the witness of the Holy Spirit, the witness of the disciples of John. By implication, the witness of his mother, Mary, um, they're all there. But by the time we get to John chapter 2, again, no chapter divisions in the original Greek canon. At the wedding of Cana, we see the next witness, the witness of the works, or Nesim Baniflaot, the witness of miracles, specific miracles. Okay. Now, again, it, it goes now from what was testimonial witness the testimony of john the testimony of the followers of john um the witness of the holy spirit it goes from that now it's miracles becoming a further witness testifying to the messiahship and i would argue or many would argue also the deity of christ nonetheless 
This begins at Cana. Now, as we said in our introduction a few weeks ago, that John is going back always to contrast the creation and the new creation. God begins his first plan for man with a wedding of Adam and Eve. And hence, God begins his second plan for man at a wedding, the ministry of Jesus. We have the first Adam, and then we have the last Adam, the final Adam being Jesus. Um, a wedding and a wedding. Now, more about the typology in a second, I will mention it, but let's read the text beginning in verse 1 of John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, right away, we understand, on the third day in the creation in Genesis, God does a miracle with water. Hence, it's the third day, and God does a miracle with water. It points to his deity. The same God that did a miracle with water in the creation in Genesis is going to do a miracle with water in the new creation, in the gospel message of the Messiah. The third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus also was invited, and his disciples, to the wedding. And when the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. Now, the Greek text could suggest it is not just saying, what do I have to do with you, Mary? But what do we, we corporately have to do with them? Not just what do I have to do with you? What do we have to do with them is the implication. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And there were six stone water, water jugs or water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Actually, it gives a Greek metric, uh, methiel. And it goes on. And Jesus said, fill the water pots or fill the water jugs with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. And when the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it was from or came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man who serves the good wine first, and when men have drunk fr freely, then that which is poorer. But you have kept the good wine until now, or the best wine until last, as some translations convey it. This beginning of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. And after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples. And there they stayed a few days. Now, there is a number of things we need to point out by way of preliminary background to this text. A number of things Let's just begin with the geography. There are two places where most scholars believe Cana was. One about three miles from Galilee. It's called um, Gafarkana. It's an Arab village today. And they think the ancient one might be a mile away from the modern one. Um, and then there is Kana, which, again, a lot of scholars think is more likely that's about eight miles from Nazareth. But it would have been smaller than Nazareth. It would have been quite small. Quite small. Nazareth would have been a hamlet on the outskirts or in the peripheral region around 
support us, the district Roman capital, support us. Well, Cana would have been like that, only smaller, only smaller, probably only a handful of families. Now, we do know that Nathaniel came from there. We're told in um, the 21st chapter of this gospel that Nathaniel, of whom there was no guile, came from there. Nathaniel, God is giving. Hence, we are introduced to Cana even before the wedding by Nathaniel. Jesus saw him under the fig tree, a metaphor for the tree of life, the man in whom there was no guile. God is given, Nathaniel, and he was from Cana. So Cana is actually introduced to us before the wedding of Cana because of the Nathaniel connection in chapter 1 of John. Okay. But let's look a bit closer. That's the geography. People would have known each other. The second feature of this is what we've mentioned. It shifts from a purely um, verbal, spoken witness of Jesus by John the Baptist and by disciples of John the Baptist who became followers, that is, apostles of Jesus. It began as a spoken, spoken testimony, okay? Then, of course, there's the witness of the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus. But then we have the third category of witnesses. That is the witness of the signs and wonders themselves. This comes into play very heavily later on in John chapters 9 and 10. More about that when we get to it. Okay, so now we're shifting gears. We're going from merely, or not merely, but from spoken testimony and Holy Spirit manifestation testimony to the testimony of miracles, of signs and wonders, of Nassim Vaniflaot. Previously, John the Baptist is filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. So we have the testimony of the Holy Spirit spoken through someone spirit-filled, John. And then we have the Holy Spirit descending directly on Jesus, and John sees it. Okay? And then we have miracles that Jesus does by the Spirit. Remember, Jesus never once used his divine power. He could have, but he declined to do so. When we understand the temptation narrative, not our purpose today, but when we understand it, Satan was trying to tempt Jesus to use his divine power out of concert with the Father. This is important. I mention it for a reason, as we'll see shortly in this text of John chapter 2. So there is that aspect. But a further aspect is this. It is a text that in the narrative, you might say explores or in some way demonstrates, demonstrates the relationship between Jesus the man and Jesus God between his divinity and his humanity. So bear those things in mind. Now, whenever we are looking at a wedding, we always think of it in terms of the parable of the wedding in John and Matthew, particularly chapter 19, and so on. The marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation the Song of Solomon, and the Bridegroom Cometh in Matthew 25. We look at all weddings in light of each other. All New Testament weddings have to be explored in light of each other and in light of the Old Testament weddings, beginning with Adam and Eve and with the Song of Solomon, certainly. The first Adam, the last Adam. 
The first Adam has a wedding, falls into sin. The last Adam has a wedding, does not. Now, this is not where Jesus marries the church per se. It is not where he marries the church per se. Neither is it where he formally becomes engaged to the church. If you have listened to our teachings on the Jewish wedding or on, on the parable of the wedding in, in, in Matthew chapter 19, we explain in some depth, as we do on certain other teachings, that Jewish weddings had three primary phases that were all legally required. Three primary phases that were all legally required. The betrothal, the nuptial itself, and the consummation. The betrothal takes place in his first coming. In his second coming, it is the nuptial, the marriage supper, and then eternity is the consummation. We shall be one with him. Matthew 19 speaks about the mysteries of marriage in light of Genesis as well. But then, of course, as we continue, we have the parable of the wedding, the parable of the wedding also. The wedding at Cana must be examined in light of these other wedding narratives, must be <laughs> examined in light of these other wedding narratives. How do we say it? <coughs> Jesus becomes formally engaged legally when he says, behold, I go and prepare a place for you. The bridegroom would go away for about a year after the marriage is agreed legally that is when the betrothal takes place, normally at Passover time. I go and prepare a place for you. He goes and he builds an extension to his father's house. And he returns in about a year. She doesn't know the day or the hour. She only knows it'll be in the night. And approximately what time? Now, the Song of Solomon, of course, deals with this extensively because it was arranged at Passover time, which is the spring, and you see the flora and the plants and the, um, the mating of the animals and so forth in nature. <clears throat> well, so these are the signs that the bridegroom is coming back. He's can be gone for about a year. We got engaged at Passover. Now it's Passover time again, and she's looking at the signs of the Caesars, of the end of the winter, the coming of the spring, and knows the time is getting closer. And so the faithful bride, the church, will look at the signs of his return. But we know it'll be in the night. It'll be in a dark period. Well, that is the betrothal. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. The marriage supper of the Lamb, that will be the actual nuptial. And then, of course, the consummation will be in eternity. This is none of those three phases, but it is an illustration of the fact, or of the doctrinal theology, that as the first Adam had a wedding and fell, the second Adam is going to begin over at a wedding, okay? At a wedding. It is interesting that the bride is not mentioned only the bridegroom, only the bridegroom. The fact that the text tells us that Jesus' siblings and mother were present is of significance in itself culturally. It was not just the whole family was invited to the wedding, although that was certainly the case. But it illustrates the fact that at the marriage of the Lamb, the family will be present. Okay. The family will be present. We're going to have Mary and people like this. They, she will be at her son's wedding. Again, it is a typological foreshadowing. 
but it has meaning. Okay, let's look. The line, the line gives out. Let's understand the line. We can look at a number of passages. Let's look at one in the book of Judges. Chapter 9. Now, Jesus never said, learn the parable of the fig tree. He said, learn the parable of the fig tree and the other trees. But we see the parable of the fig trees and the other trees in Judges 9. This has a deep meaning for the close of the age with the fig tree. In verse 10, You'll come reign over us, but the fig tree said, Shall I leave my sweetness and good fruit to worry over other trees? The unfaithfulness of Israel. The tree said to the vine, You come reign over us. But the vine said, Shall I leave my new wine? The new wine. Look with me, please, to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 26, I believe. Yeah. This chapter speaks of a number of things. It speaks certainly of the resurrection in verse 19. It speaks of the darkness at the close of the age in verse 20. It also speaks about the return of Christ in verse 17, the mother in labor. And it speaks about how we are not going to know who our unsaved loved ones were in eternity. The, the memory of them will be erased. Okay, the memory of them will be erased in verse 14. Chapter 26 is a deep, deep, very deep chapter concerning prophecy. In verse 9, we see what we see in the Song of Solomon and also what we see in Matthew 25. At night, my soul longs for thee, just like Shulamit in the Song of Solomon. Same idea, okay? The same idea kind of, 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 of wedding language, of, 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 of marital, marital imagery. Okay. Well, things are going to take place. And we are told that the new wine mourns. The new wine mourns. <laughs> this is a sad saga. We've pointed out before that the Holy Spirit represents or is represented by different liquids and different aspects of his person and ministry. We know living water, my mayim. We know the shemen, the anointing of the Spirit, oil. And we also know the new wine, the new wine. And we're told that it's going to happen at the close of the age that the gaiety of the harp will cease and that the new wine will mourn. In Matthew 24, verse 7, the new wine mourns, the vine decays, all the merry hearted sigh. The gaiety of the tambourine ceases. The noise of revelers stops, the gaiety of harps ceases. They do not drink wine with song. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. That whole section of Isaiah from chapter 24 through 29 is very important in, in the prophecies concerning the close of the age. But the new wine will mourn. Something is going to happen. People will be celebratory. 
the danger is they will be worshiping worship and using the name of the Lord for self-glorification. This is in Isaiah 28, verse 1. Woe to the proud crown, proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim. Okay? But these are issues that will happen at the end. Not our primary subject now, but notice the prominence of new wine. The new wine. There's the old wine and the new wine. I have explained this before. In the Old Covenant, up until the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was for certain people at certain times. It was for patriarchs, judges, high priests, kings, and prophets. And following the resurrection of Jesus, but before the day of Pentecost, he breathed on the apostles and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Certain individuals, certain individuals, okay? The Holy Spirit was limited to working in and through individuals. He did not convict this world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He did not restrain evil. He was not the catacomb in the Old Covenant, per se. That didn't happen. It was the Holy Spirit, but not in the fullness of the kind of power we see exhibited in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. He was there for individuals. Not in the regenerative sense, however. People could not be born again in the New Testament sense because the Messiah had not yet died. Even though there was a kind of renewal, it was not salvific. The Old Testament saints had to go to the bosom of Abraham and wait for the Messiah to come. They could only be saved by the blood of Jesus. So, yes, the Holy Spirit was there. The living water was there. The shemen, the anointing oil, was there. Okay. The new wine, I'm sorry, the wine was there. But not in the New Testament sense. The flowing out of him of living waters is not so much. Now, this is going to be even more powerful in the millennium. We read about this outpouring that's going to take place, and among other passages, the 47th chapter of Ezekiel. Not our subject today, I only mention it in passing. The living water was there, the anointing oil was there, the wine was there, but not in the New Testament sense. It was limited. He did not function as catacomb. He did not convict the world, per se, concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. God's Spirit did not empower the church. It was not like that, and it was not poured out on, on, on Christ and onto his body, and it was not for all who believed. It was not like now. So you had old wine and new wine. When we are told that the bridegroom has saved the new wine for last, he gives the ordinary wine, not that there was anything wrong with it, but it was not the same. He gave the ordinary wine first, but the new wine, the best wine, last. The law was good. It was there as our tutor to point us to Christ. It was there to show us through the example of Israel and the Jews that man is fallen and cannot save themselves and they need a savior. It was there. The Shekinah operated in the Old Covenant. It was there. 
but not like in the new covenant when it dwelt among us in the flesh. The new wine. If the old wine and the new wine. God gave the ordinary wine. That is what we might call a kind of religious wine. I don't use the term religious um, condescendingly when I speak about Old Testament Judaism. But it was a religion. It was, it was a work-based righteousness designed to show that our own righteousness was as filthy rags. We need a savior. Nonetheless, the Holy Spirit was operative but not in the sense he is now. Now the new wine will mourn. The new wine will mourn. The catacomb, the restrainer, will stop restraining. All hell will break loose on earth with the advent of Antichrist. And the way the world is going, we're seeing that happening. In a variety of spheres. Corruption of government, corruption of the church, the sins of Sodom, and so forth. We're seeing it's going that way, but the worst is yet to come. The new wine is going to mourn. But since Pentecost, we've had the new wine. Now, we're not to fret. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, the best wine is still yet to come. Nonetheless, let's look. You saved the best wine to last. It's showing the relationship between the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, and the gospel. It is the same thing of turning the water into wine. Remember, wine is a picture of the Holy Spirit, particularly in things like worship. Turning the water into wine. When we get to John 3, we will see born of water and the Spirit. Biological birth, embryonic sac, water. Second birth, birth of the Spirit. What does Paul say in Timothy? That we go about like containers carrying, die, dying always, but we're like containers being given over to be smashed. The old nature being killed. Water containers. These containers were designed to hold the Holy Spirit. We'll see this in John 4 with the woman at the well when she leaves her water container, which gets to living water. More about that when we get to John 4. Changing the water to wine demonstrates second birth. Born of the water and of the Spirit. When somebody is regenerate, when somebody is born again, they go from being a biological creature that is spiritually dead to a new creation that is spiritually alive. Now let's talk about the water. There was some Maim Hayim, a living water, that was potable, that you could drink it safely. However, water in the Middle East to this day and in much of the third world is a problem. I know there's all kinds of arguments about fluoridation and so forth and ab about chlorification of water. In the ancient world, they had different ways of fighting bacteria even though they didn't know what the bacteria was. In cisterns, they would add certain herbs. They just knew the herbs worked to stop the water from becoming contaminated. Well, the other was treating or combining the water with wine, with fermented juice. 
It could be anywhere from about 10, 12, 15%, say, wine, up to maybe 25 to 30% wine. Now, it was not just as some have suggested alcohol purified water. That's nonsense. You might get that at the lower end of the spectrum, but it had taste. It didn't taste like water. It tasted like wine. So it was not just just a little bit to kill the back. No, no. Some people have tried to say that. Some people have said that the Lord would never sin and drinking alcohol is sin. And therefore, there was no alcohol in it. It was only grape juice. This is blithering ignorance. Think of putting new wine in old wineskins. There had to be a fermentation reaction for the CO2 to cause the wineskins to rip, obviously. There was no refrigeration or anything. There was nothing to stop fermentation. There was a fermentation reaction. It was alcohol. The question is, the alcohol content, it was diluted. It was diluted from anywhere from, say, 10, 12% up to maybe no more than 30, maybe a third, a third at the most. Undiluted, undiluted wine was known as strong drink. It was not talking about spirits, about whiskey. That was not invented to the 8th century. Distillation was not invented to the 8th century by the Arabs. But you could have had hyperfermented, the equivalent in constituency of what we would call brandy or cognac. Strong drink, strong drink. Strong drink may have had medicinal value. Strong drink may have had medicinal values. Fighting infections and things like this was an antiseptic applied topically with oil or something of this nature. But strong drink is not given, the king should not be given to strong drink. In other words, we shouldn't drink too much, too much strong alcohol. Um, the wine was diluted. You would have to drink an exorbitant amount of it to become intoxicated. You wouldn't get intoxicated by drinking it. On the other hand, it certainly did contain alcohol. Okay. It prevented the water from being an agent of infection carrying contagions. Waterborne infection. This can be a very serious problem to this day. In the extreme case, it would be cholera. Cholera. And that can still happen in India and certain areas of Africa and so forth. Cholera would be the most extreme. Okay. Giardella infections. Other things like this. Amoebic dysentery. These things can be communicated through a unprocessed water supply, through a water supply that's contaminated. I've seen people drinking contaminated water in India. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. Okay. The power of the wine prevented the water from making people ill, sick. Natural man, natural women are sick. Because of the fall, we are sick. We are sick, or in fact, we're dead spiritually before we're born again. We are sick mentally. Every unsaved person is crazy. Not necessarily dysfunctional, but to some degree crazy. The Lord gives us the power of sound mind. The whole world is nuts. The only question is to what degree and what way. Okay. And people get sick physically. Now, none of this was God's will. 
Let us talk about spiritual and mental illness. It's a thing of the flesh. The agents of infection are transmitted in water supply. You had terrible things happening in Flint, Michigan with oh, lead and oh my lord, all kinds of things. But the contagions, and again, the go Google cholera. Maybe there's um, even videos of people suffering from it. You, you don't want to know about it. Um, I've seen some terrible things in, in Egypt and, oh, my India, my God, it's awful. I don't want to nauseate you. Okay. It is the Holy Spirit that purifies the flesh. The wine purifies the water. Born of water and the spirit. Without the wine, without being combined with the wine, the water is going to become, to some degree, toxic. The human soul is toxic. The human spirit is dead. It affects us physically. It's contaminated. It's infected with sin, with the homotosphere. It is the wine that makes the difference. Why do people give up smoking cigarettes and getting alcoholics stop drinking and drug addicts stop injecting drugs when they become Christians? What has given them the power to do it? If somebody is seriously addicted, they don't have the power to stop. It is God's spirit that empowers them to stop. Walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Without the wine, the water will make you sick. The natural man, the natural woman are sick creatures. We need the wine. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a bit of wine. The law at least made people aware of what sin was and said, don't do it. But it couldn't prevent people from doing it. The Old Testament shows through the example of Israel and the Jews, the law is the law of sin and death. It's as much a law as gravity. People must succumb to it. It is only when they come under the law of Christ and have the Holy Spirit that they can overcome it. The water is turned to wine. It is showing a relationship between the old covenant and the new, the old creation and the new creation. Now it's interesting that the servants knew it. But the head waiter did not know it. He called the bridegroom. Here the bridegroom does typify Christ. Every man serves the good wine first. When men have drunk freely, then that which is poorer. But you've kept the good wine until now, the good wine until last. One of the saddest, most pathetic things I ever saw was when the late John Wimber introduced Mike Pickle and the Kansas City Prophets. And the final speaker in London in August of 1990, who Mr. Wimber brought out after Mike Bickle and Bob Jones, was the homosexual, pedophile, alcoholic Paul Kane. And John Wimber from the Vineyard Movement said, we've saved the best wine until last. That's literally what they said. This homosexual pedophile and an alcoholic on top of it. That was John Wimber's idea of the best wine. And it was the whole thing with Mike Pickle and all this stuff. If you don't know, last week, the IHOP, the Kansas City International House of Prayer, so-called, 
legally closed down and switched its name, reincorporated under a different name. It did so in part under legal advice to protect itself from the lawsuits being brought against it because of the sexually predatory behavior of Mike Pickle. Uh, this kind of thing happened at Hillsong. They didn't change their name, but it was the same thing. There was the danger of lawsuits. Now, these are the people who said they had the new wine. This just shows you how sick and depraved the new apostolic reformation is, the restoration movement is, the kingdom now, dominion theology, the I hop the rest of it. This stuff is just twisted. That's not what the new wine means. But now let's go back to the beginning. His mother comes to him. There are two perversions in this text found in Roman, in heretical Roman Catholic so-called theology. One, they call it a sacrament, an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Um, it is not, the, and the Catholics have two kinds, actual grace and sanctifying grace. Well, you can argue for sanctification, meaning set apart. In holy matrimony, God sets this man apart to this woman, this woman apart to this man. But actual grace, something that's salvific, that's absurd. There's contradictions, apparently, in the Roman Catholic Catechism. The salvation come by baptism, by penance, or by the Eucharist. Or certain references... Matrimony. Unbelievable. No, salvation doesn't come by any sacrament, by any ritual. But also, they derive the doctrine of Mary as the arch intercessoress or the co mediatrix with the Father. That as Jesus did what Mary wanted at Cana. He might not want to do it, but if you know his mother and you're on good terms with Mary because you sing the Regina Chaley and the Angelus and you say the rosary and you wear a scapula of Mary and the sacred heart of, oh boy. If you do the Mary thing, the Lord's thing, the Fatima thing, the Guadalupe thing, the Magigori thing, the Knock thing in Ireland, and then so on. If you do the Mary thing, the Mount Carmel thing in Israel, whatever it is. If you do the Mary thing, Ave Maria Tree, it's good to see you. If you're in with his mother, she'll put in a good word for you with her son. He didn't want to do it. He wasn't going to do it. But who can turn down their mother? And so his mother went to him and said, so therefore, if we need something or want something, we go to Mary and she'll go to him. <laughs> now, this is actual Roman Catholic doctrine. They pray, Mary, we have recourse to thee. Um, um, may I now and at the hour of our death, they want Mary with them when they die. <laughs> now, we've talked a lot about Mary. They ascribe the attributes of Diana, of Ephesus, of Artemis, and things like this to Mary. They'll be sacrificing cakes to the Queen of Heaven, we're told in Jeremiah. This is all pagan. This is not the real Mary. Let's understand this in light of other passages in John, which we'll also revisit in our future Bible studies. Turn with me, please, to John 5.
Verse 19. Jesus therefore answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does in like manner. Now this goes back to John 1. The Father made the universe through Jesus. It goes back to Proverbs 8. Jesus is the creative agent of the Father. The Father creates through the Son by the Spirit. Again, Jesus, because he was God, could have used his divine power out of concert with the Father, but didn't. He only did what he saw his Father doing. He was the last Adam. He had to limit himself to the same parameters of Adam. Let's look at John 5 even further. Verse 30 of John 5. Again, we'll be coming back to this, Lord willing. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I can only do what my father does. He does not act at his own behest. Jesus never acted on his own behest because he was God. He objectively could have, but he never did. He limited himself to what we are as we examined when we did our series on the book of Philippians. Kenosis. He only did what his father told him. Or, even more accurately, what his father did through him. By the Spirit. He does not act on his own behest, much less at the behest of Mary, his mother, he was not acting at her behest. He says, woman, what do I have to do with you? As a man, Jesus showed deference and regard to his mother. That is true. But as God, he addresses her as woman. Think of his bar mitzvah and Luke's gospel when he's teaching the wise men in the temple. What happens? Jesus, how could you do this? Where were you? We, what does he say? I'm bar mitzvah age. I'm a man. It's about time for me to be about my father's business. It draws the distinction between him as man and him as God. This text is one of the key texts in the Gospels. And not only the Gospels, but now we're in the Gospels that illustrate the dual nature of Christ as fully human and fully divine. Yes, he loved his mother held her in high regard. But he came to do the will of his father, not the will of his mother. She is the earthly mother of Christ. But Jesus was pre-existent. He existed before Mary did. How could God have a mother? Theotokos, the Greek term is not even in the New Testament. God has no mother or no father. God is the father. What do I have to do with you? But it, some translations say, what do we have to do? Then it reverts to the human. She doesn't argue with them. She just says whatever he says do. 
whatever he says, do. Don't do what I say, do what he says. Mary had cachet with her son as any mother would have with her son in her normal family relationship. But she had no particular cachet with him as God other than what anyone else has who believes in God. Woman. He doesn't call her mother. He calls her woman. In the human sense, Ima, mother. In the spiritual sense, woman. Again, this Roman Catholic nonsense. They take one passage out of context in isolation from co-text. They don't look at John 2 in light of John 5. That's how they arrive at the Eucharist lie. That is how they arrive at the Peter primacy lie. Oh, the, the Peter being the rock. The text out of context and isolation from co-text. Now notice there are six water jugs. Man was created on the sixth day. Water and spirit. So, the six goes right back to Genesis, the, the, the symbolism of Genesis. Okay. The new wine is served. Now, notice something. Canaan is not the site of the first miracle of Jesus alone. It is also the site of the second. Depending on how we count it, some count it as seven IMs, but there technically is an eighth. Some say there are seven miracles. Others say there are eight in John's Gospel. We'll deal with that when we get to it. But what is clear is this is the first one. But the second one also happens at Cana. Look with me. We'll do this when we get to it. But John chapter 4, verse 46. He came to Cana. And he made the, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son or nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And as we will see when we get to it, he came to Jesus at Cana. Although the healing takes place by remote control, <coughs> the healing takes place at Capernaum, where Jesus would live. He does the miracle in Cana. So Cana is the first miracle of Jesus, but it's also where he performs the second, even though its ramification is in Capernaum where he would live. Okay. Now this connection between Cana and Capernaum is most interesting. Let's come down. These are the beginning of the signs he did in Cana. In verse 11, manifested his glory and his disciples believed in it. After this, he went down to Capernaum, Kephar of Nahum, the village of the consoled. Now it becomes familial again. He and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. They go with him to Capernaum. Again, the Roman church says when it says his brothers, it does not mean siblings or biological brothers. They even cooked up a later tradition sometime later that Joseph had been married previously and Jesus had stepbrothers. Again, no biblical basis and no early historical basis. 
the context. His mothers, his brothers, and his disciples. If it was speaking about brothers and brothers in faith, as brothers in faith, Sandy and myself are brothers, James and myself are brothers, Sandy and James are brothers. We're brothers in faith. Okay, that is true. But notice the text in context draws a distinction between biological relatives, his mother and brothers, and his disciples. If it was only speaking about brothers as brothers in faith, it wouldn't have to draw the distinction as disciples because his disciples were his brothers in faith. Okay. <laughs> Again, another Roman Catholic lie that Jesus had no siblings, that Mary was perpetually a virgin, which would have invalidated her marriage by Jewish law. So we have Canaan, the wedding at Canaan. Let's recap. Until now, it is spoken testimony and the testimony of the Holy Spirit as to the deity and messiahship of Christ. At Canaan, as we read in John 5, the miracles, the signs and wonders testify, bear witness to him in themselves. Now notice, these signs follow. First, the text talks about the word. Then it talks about the signs. It is not like these con artists and ignorant people listen to con artists. That we have the power, not the dead letter of the law. They demean the word of God to lift up signs and wonders, not understanding what signs and wonders mean and what they're for. No, the scriptures tell us it is the word that bears witness to him first. John the Baptist did no miracle, but many people believed in it. Where he did miracles later on, as we'll see in John 9 and 10, People wanted to stone him. It was where John testified to him, and John did know miracles that people believed. But I don't want to go there now. We'll do it when we get there, Lord willing. So, we shift. We have the witness of John and his disciples and his mother and the witness of the Holy Spirit above all. Now we have the witness of the works. Secondly, it shows the relationship between Jesus as God and Jesus as man, the last Adam, yet the eternal Logos. Thirdly, it continues John's theme, the Yohanine theme, of contrasting creation and new creation. It goes back to Genesis. Six stones of water, man's made the sixth day, born of water and the spirit. And then we see the wine and the best wine. The wine and the best wine. Moving on beyond that, not only does the first miracle of Jesus take place in Cana, so does the second. The birthplace of Nathaniel, a man in whom there is no guile. Where Jesus saw Nathaniel under the fig tree. Metaphor for the tree of life. This is his first miracle. It foreshadows his engagement, marriage to the church, even though that's not when the betrothal formally happened, or the wedding formally happened, etc., or the consummation formally happened. It does foreshadow it. The bride is not named at this particular point. So, 
We will continue, Lord willing, next week from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 2, the first cleansing of the temple. We'll begin in verse 13 of John 2 next week.